This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. This hour in Hollywood is presented by the makers of Lux Flakes, those sheer fine flakes that keep fabrics and colors smart, new-looking, and fresh so much longer. That's why they're used in all the leading studios, including Paramount, whose world-famous director now takes his place by the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. (laughs) Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The island of Manhattan was bought from the Indians for merchandise valued at $18.21. Critics say that the 21 cents was for Brooklyn. (laughs) If that's true, small change made great changes in motion pictures because one Brooklyn neighborhood gave the screen Norma and Constance Talmadge, Lillian and Dorothy Gish, Anita Stewart, Irving Thalberg, and the star of tonight's production, Marion Davies. Known throughout the world for her generous support of deserving enterprises, Miss Davies' most famous charity is the Children's Clinic, built and maintained by her at Hotel, California. Throughout her career as artist model, chorus girl, Shakespearean actress, and picture star, she has preserved a refreshing wit. She's unexcelled as comedian and mimic. Her father was Judge Bernard J. Duras, a New York magistrate. And as a little girl, she often watched the drab parade of transgression and poverty that passed before his bench. In the role of the brat, she plays a character that she's known since childhood. The courtroom in which our play opens might well have been the very room in which she and her father sat so many times. Co-starring with Miss Davies in tonight's drama is Joel McRae as Steve Forrester, the black sheep of a wealthy New York family. Both Miss Davies and I claim to have discovered Joel, but I'll take that argument up with a a little later. And now, the curtain rises in the Lux Radio Theater. The play is The Brat, and here are Miss Marion Davies and Mr. Joel McRae. On a dimly lighted side street in New York's West 50s, Manhattan's famous night court is in session. A restless crowd stares and murmurs. Along the wall is ranged a line of shabby miscreants. They shuffle uneasily in their places, waiting their turn before the bench. Next case. Daniel A. Fogarty. Here. Stand over there. What's the charge? Disturbing the peace, engaging in a fist fight, and resisting arrest. Guilty or not guilty? Your Honor, I was only... Guilty to... or not guilty? Uh, guilty, Your Honor, but there wasn't any fight, Your no Honor. No fight? Uh, no, Your Honor. You see, the man was no match for me at all, at all. He was... That's little... enough. Ten days. Ten days? Why, Your Honor, Come no... On. Glory be, and what did I tell me? I was woman this time now. Stop it! Stop it, let me go. I ain't done nothing. I ain't done anything. Uh, come on, you come got on, no right now. to. Quiet, now. None of your lips. What's the matter there, Order. Quiet. You, you ain't got no right to do this. Quiet. What's the matter, officer? This girl, Your Honor, she wouldn't come with me peaceful. I had to drag her for six blocks. But I ain't done nothing, Judge. Honest, I ain't. Just a moment. What's the charge, officer? Vagrancy, Your Honor. Vagrancy. Well, young lady, anything to say? No, sir. Why not? Because I don't know what it means. <laughs> Quiet. What's your name? Peggy McLaren. And where do you live, Peggy? I don't live anywhere now. You have no home? No, sir. You see, I just come out of the hospital a couple of days ago. I was sick. I went back to the dance hall on Delancey Street where I used to work. Only they wouldn't give me my jaw back again because they said I got too skinny and I didn't have no money or nothing, so, so I didn't have no place to go. I see. Well, that's what we mean by vagrancy. People who have no jobs and no homes are called vagrants. So you arrest him. That's fine, that is. How can a guy get a job or a home when you got him locked up in the jug? Order! (laughs) You don't seem to understand, Peggy. We don't arrest vagrants as criminals. We do it for their own good, to take them off the streets. That copy yours took me off the street, all right. 
He almost broke me arm. Well, you should have come with him peacefully. Now tell me, before you went to the hospital, where did you live then? Delancey in Cooper Street. I lived there with an old lady. She said she was my aunt. She said she was your aunt? Yeah, I didn't know her so well personally. <laughs> Why didn't you go back to her? Well, I wanted to. But when she found out I didn't have no job and couldn't bring her no wages, she said she wasn't my aunt no more. You have no one else you could go to? No parents? No, sir. I ain't had any parents since... Uh, since I can remember. Well, I'm afraid there's only one thing we can do. You ain't going to send me up. Not to jail. Oh, no, no, of course not. But for your own protection, I think we'll have to put you somewhere where you can get the proper care and nourishment until you get on your feet again. You mean... You mean a home? Yes, a home for girls. Oh, no, Judge, please. Don't send me to one of those places. Please don't send me... No, no, it's not so bad as that. But I don't want to go. I'll get a job again. Give me a chance, please. Oh, please, give me a chance. Uh, now, now, there's no use crying here. <laughs> Look up here. Your yes? Oh, good evening, Macmillan. May I speak to you a moment? I'm sorry, but it's about this case. Oh, I'd like to speak to you alone. Of course. Now, you go over there and sit down, young lady. And please try to stop crying. Come into my chambers, will you, Macmillan? Well, Mac? What are you doing down this way? Looking for a little local color. For your new book, I suppose. That's right, and I think I've got it. That girl, Judge Henry. <laughs> what about her? She's just the type I've been looking for. I'd like a chance to know her better, to study her. You see, the book's called The Breath, and she fits it to perfection. There's not much doubt about that. But how are you going to get a chance to study her? I mean, uh... Well, here's the way I see it. If I could take her home with me for a few months... Take her home? Uh, I don't think your mother would appreciate that. Oh, she won't mind, and it's a great opportunity for the girl. Between Mother and me, we ought to be able to make something out of her. Well, I don't know, Mac. I can't give her over into your charge. But if Mrs. Forrester is willing to do it... I'll give her a ring right now. Well, there's the phone. Thank you. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, she's right here. Who is it, gentlemen? Mr. Macmillan, ma'am. Hello? Yes, Macmillan. Where? Well, what are you doing there? Oh. Bring her here? But what for? Well, well, of course, if you want to, Macmillan, but I really don't see... Well, well, very well, dear. Yes, yes, I will. Goodbye, dear. Simpson. Yes, Mrs. Potterford? My son is bringing a young lady home with him. Have some sandwiches and coffee ready, please. Very good, ma'am. <laughs> Is that you, Mac? No, Mother. Oh, Stephen. Hello, Mother. How are you feeling? Very badly, thanks to you. Why? What's the matter? You know very well what's the matter. Where have you been all evening? At the club. I thought so. You've been drinking again, haven't you? Well, I had one, if that's what you mean. Well, that's one too many for you, Stephen. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mother. You treat me as if I were a child. That's the only way you deserve to be treated. Why weren't you home for dinner? I didn't know you expected me. But you might have called. I'm sorry, Mother. I didn't know you'd worry. Not worry. With you out until all hours, carousing around with those good-for-nothing friends of yours? Why shouldn't I worry? Well, my friends are all right. Yes, you think they are, because they're just like you. A lot of young wastrels. Wastrels? Is that your opinion of me? If you want the truth, Stephen, yes. You have the spark of ambition in your whole makeup. If you had, you'd have stayed in college. Instead, you failed miserably. Well, that wasn't entirely my fault. I didn't want to study art, you know that. You and Mac made me. I wanted to go to a regular school and be a real man. Your brother Mac is an artist, an author. Do you mean to insinuate that he's not a real man? Oh, you know what I mean. I wanted to study engineering and build roads and bridges. Yes, and because we didn't allow you, you insist on drinking yourself to death. Oh, but, Mother, it isn't as bad as that. I take a little sometimes. I probably wouldn't take anything if you'd let me alone. Oh. You and Mac nag at me from morning to night. All I get is criticism, suspicion, discouragement. Everything I do seems to be wrong. Mother, why don't you let me go out west? I could work on the ranch. I know I could. What ranch are you speaking of? Dad's old place in Wyoming. Oh. I'd be a lot happier out well, there. Well, I don't mind your going, but I'll have to see your brother first. He'll decide what's best for you. Excuse me, Mrs. Forrester? Yes, Simpson, what is it? Will you be needing me anymore tonight, ma'am? No, I don't think so. Just lock the windows, please. Very good, ma'am. I'm going upstairs now, Stephen. We'll talk about the trip west in the morning. Good night. Good night, Mother. 
Oh, Timpson. Yes, Mr. Steele? Uh, is my brother in yet? No, Mr. McMillan is at the night court, sir. At the night court? <laughs> he hasn't been arrested, has he? Oh, not at all. He's looking for a female character to write into his new book. Ah, The Brat by Mr. McMillan Forrester. The life story of a child of the slum. That's it, sir. That's it. Uh, uh, Timpson. Timpson, come here. Is there uh, any liquid refreshment about? Liquid refreshment? Hmm. But, Mr. Steve, I thought you weren't going to drink any more. I was merely crippled with good intentions. At your age, sir. Age is a mental condition, Timson. A moment ago, I was a pure old man. Just now, I'm a bad boy about to play hooky from school. Ah, you're a bit of a tall talker like your father, Mr. Steve. He could say 40 words and there wouldn't be a bit of sense in 39 of them. I'm like my father, eh? I don't remember him very well. What kind of a man was he, Timson? A fine, upstanding, dependable man. And that's what he was. Oh, I'm no relative to him, then. Fat you're his twin, only a few years younger. No, Timson, you're all wrong. You know what I am? I'm a wastrel, Timson. I haven't a spark of ambition. I was even fired out of college. Yes, sir. I should have heard your mother speak of it, sir. Yes, I'll bet you have. Now, what about that little nip? Are you sure it's all right, sir? No, Mrs. Forrester said... Never that... mind that now, Timson. Give me the keys to the closet. Oh, I can't do that, sir. But listen... I'll go upstairs with you and see if I can find some... Ah, now you're talking, Timson. Come on. Hey, mister. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Not at all. Where are we going? You'll see. The judge said you were going to take care of me. Is that right? Right. Well, what's the layout? The layout? Yeah, the payoff. What's it all about? Oh, I'll explain it to you later. This is the house. Come on. Are you sure it's all right? Of course. I mean, nobody's going to get sore or nothing. <laughs> I don't think so. There we are. Go ahead. Thanks. Say, is this where you're bored? Well, yes, in a manner of speaking. Gee, it's a swell dump, all right. Not so bad. Real fireplace and everything. Brr. Me mitts his hair froze. Sit down. I think you'll find this chair pretty comfortable. No, I guess I'd get it dirty. I've been walking around in the mud all day. All day? Yeah, it's been a long day, too. I didn't know I was so tired till I sat down in your automobile. Well, why didn't you take a little nap on the way up? I can't sleep if I'm scared. Scared? You're not scared now, are you? Uh-huh. Well, nothing's going to hurt you here. Well, how hungry are you? Well, I had a cup of coffee for breakfast. Nothing since? No. Nope. Well, I'll see if I can't hustle up a sandwich for you. Make mine a hamburger. I don't believe there's a bit of hamburger in the house. Wouldn't chicken do? Chicken? Ah, you're kidding me. No, I'm not. If everybody hasn't gone to bed, we'll have a bite of supper together. Wait. I wouldn't ring that bell if I was you. Why not? Well, if you get your landlady up, she'll be awful sore on you. <laughs> Don't worry. She's used to me by this time. Sit down. Well, I guess I can take a chance. Hey, Pipe, what's coming down the stairs? Is that your father? Hardly. His name is Timpson. Well, you do the swear, and I won't say a word. You rang, sir? Yes, Timpson, I want you to get a few sandwiches and a pot of hot coffee and make the sandwiches thick. The sandwiches are already made, sir. Good, rush them along, will you, Timpson? Very good, sir. He's a mean-looking old guy, ain't he? I never seen a landlady's husband yet that wasn't a grouch. Wouldn't you like to take off your coat? Yeah, I guess so. You didn't seem to like the night court. I wasn't ever there before. I guess you laughed the way I was, you know, carrying on so. No, why should I? Because I was so green. Where were you when they picked you up? Sitting on a bench... I was scared stiff the way that cop spoke to me. Why didn't you come with him when he asked you to? I don't know. Say, you're awful nosy, ain't you? <laughs> That's my business. I'm a writer. I like to find things out. Then you put them in the newspaper? No, I put them in a book, and then I sell the book. Oh. Don't you get awful tired walking from house to house? <laughs> Say, what if you had shoes like mine? They was gifted to me in the hospital. When I get rich someday, I'm going to have two pairs of shoes, so I won't know which ones to put on. When you get rich... <laughs> Well, I can't make you rich, but I might be able to help you a little. How do you mean? Well, right now, you have no home, no relatives, no friends. Nothing. If you left here now, you'd have no place at all to go, would you? No. Nope. Well, you don't have to leave. I'd like you to stay. Here, in this place? Yes, I need someone to work with me, sort of a secretary. And I'm sure my mother could find something for you to do. In return, we can offer you a good home, good clothes, and good food. Then it'd be like, like I was working here? You'd given me a regular job? Yes. Oh, gee, Oh, gosh, mister, that's... That's just well of you. Yeah, yeah, please, please. You mustn't do that. Take my handkerchief. Handkerchief? It looks like a towel. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, no more tears. No. Nary one. The sandwiches, Mr. McMillan? Oh, yes, put them down over here, Timpson. All right, sir. 
There we are. Now, young lady. Oh, look, a whole flock of them. Which one can I have? Any one you like. Thanks. Oh, gee, look at the letters. Gee, you're rich, ain't you? Do you want your coffee now? I can't swallow only one thing at a time. Do you want cream, sugar, or both? Don't ask me nothing for a while. Me ears is busy. Listen to me teeth chew. <laughs> your coffee, miss? Papa go. I beg your pardon. Papa go. Timson, she means put it down. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Say, he don't understand much English, does he? Not much. I beg your pardon, sir. Timson, will you run upstairs and see if my mother's still awake? If she is, ask her to come down here, please. Very good, sir. Excuse me. Hello. Oh, hello, Angela. Yes, I just got in. What? Oh, I'm sorry, Angela. I forgot all about it. I went downtown to the night court and I... Oh, please don't be angry, Angela. L listen, meet me tomorrow for lunch and I'll tell you all about it. Yes, at the Ritz, will you? All right. Good night, Angela. Angela, is that a dame? It's a girl, if that's what you mean. Oh, a real high-class dame, huh? Uh-huh. What's the matter, getting a little sleepy? Yeah, I wish I could die right now. Well, why wish that? Because my stomach is so happy. Well, there are some more sandwiches left. You'll have to finish them. Gee, I don't think... I don't think I can hold them. Can I save this big one till tomorrow? Certainly, if you wish. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's nice and warm in here. Mm. Tell me, why didn't you apply to some some benevolent association? There are plenty scattered over the city. At least I've always heard there were. Why didn't you go to one of them? I said, why didn't you... Are you asleep? <laughs> All tuckered out. McMillan. Shh. Come here, Mother. You want me, dear? I thought you were going to bring some Shh. girl. Oh. There she is. She's asleep. Well, for heaven's sake. She's just what I've been looking for, Mother. What? A little savage living by her wits. If I can keep her here for a while, I'll have a perfect living model of the brat. <laughs> well, it certainly is trying to live with a genius. But if you want her to stay, well, stay she shall. I'll call Margot. Thanks. You can give her some kind of an outfit for tonight, and I'll see that she has some decent clothes tomorrow. What's that? Let me alone. Let me alone, Tim. Well, it's, it's Steve. Has he been drinking again? Oh, I don't know, Mac. He was all right before. Mr. Steve, go upstairs now again like a good man. No, no, no. I want a little drink. Steve. Well, if it ain't Mac. Hello, Mac, old boy. How are you? Oh, Steve. I'll handle this, Steve. Mother. Steve, come down here. Sure, sure. Come on, Timson. Mac wants to... Oh! Holy mackerel, the joint spins. What's going on here? Be quiet, please. Ah, oh, there you are, there. You're all right. No, Mr. Steve, you're all right. What happened? You fell down the stairs. That's what happened. Stand up. You've no right in a decent house with decent people. You belong in some cheap tenement, a corner bar room, you dirty little tramp. Grab, huh? Give me a lift, Timson. Yes, sir. Timson, you leave him alone. Steve, you've been carried up those stairs for the last time. Either you get up alone or you stay where you are for the rest of the night. All right. I'll get up alone. Why don't you let the old guy help him? He can't get up alone. You keep out of this, please. What are you picking on him for, all of you? Who is he anyway? He's my son. Well, get a move on your den and put him to bed. What the deuce is the matter with you fellas? Come on, buddy. I'll give you a hand myself. <laughs> a minute, we will go on with Act Two of The Brat, starring Marion Davies and Joel McRae. Right now, I notice a very attractive young woman standing beside our announcer, Mr. Roick. I know he wants to introduce her to our radio audience. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest here tonight is not in the movies, but she probably knows movie stars as intimately as anyone in Hollywood. In fact, she sees them with their hair down. Am I right, Miss Pedretti? Yes, that's literally true, Mr. Brewing. Of course it is. Because Miss Rosa Pedretti is one of the experts in Hollywood's most famous beauty salon, West Boys. With customers like Irene Dunn. Yes, and Carol Lombard, Ruth Chatterton, Kay Francis, Betty Davis. I could name ever so many. Uh, your special work is taking care of the star's hands, isn't it? Yes. Perhaps the women listening in will think that is easy. A screen star has no housework. No scrubbing, no dishwashing to make her hands rough and red. But here's an interesting fact. I see other hands besides those of movie stars. I've seen many, many hands that go in the dishpan three times a day and yet look as soft and smooth and attractive as screen stars' hands. And it should interest you, Mr. Ruick, that so many of those women give the credit to using Lux Flakes in the dishpan regularly. We like to hear that, Miss Pedretti. Lux Flakes deserve compliments. 
They're marvelous. So gentle and soothing. I know that myself because we use them in the manicure bowls at Westmore's. We find that Lux Flakes are not drying. They don't rob the skin of its natural oils. You must have some interesting experiences in connection with your work for the stars. Yes. For instance, the other day Ruth Chatterton thought she'd like to ride down Sunset Boulevard on a motorcycle. She did, with William Wyler, her director in Dodsworth. Next morning, she was dressing for a scene in the picture and discovered that she had broken a nail. A calamity and a close-up. But Westmore fixed it up. Now, you're not going to tell me that you grow nails. Of course not. But we make them. Perfect ones of fireproof uh, celluloid. Not very practical for everyday use, but fine in an emergency. Thank you, Miss Pedretti. And now, to every woman who wants smooth, lovely hands, please remember this. Be sure to use Lux Flakes for washing dishes so you'll protect and beautify your hands. And once again, Mr. DeMille. We resume the story of The Brat, starring Marion Davies. For three months, the brat has enjoyed the comforts of the Forrester home, living a life of luxury while supplying Macmillan with material for his new book. We find her sitting importantly in Macmillan's private study. As the telephone rings, she lifts the receiver and speaks in her best society manner. Hello? Hello? Who is it? Who is it speaking, please? Who is it? Say, listen, Lizzie. Mr. Forrester's a hard-working fella, and he ain't got no time to get with a skirt that won't give a moniker. Get me? That settles that. Well, if it isn't my old friend, the brat. How are you, young lady? I beg your pardon, please. To whom would you speak in? I'm Mr. McMillan Forrester's private secretary. Oh, well, I'm Mr. McMillan's brother, Steve. You remember me, don't you? Oh, yeah. You're that funny-looking guy what lives here in this house. <laughs> right. Was you looking for somebody? Yes, I uh, was looking for you. I ain't here. Come back next Tuesday. <laughs> ah, Steve, don't it beat the devil what good times me and you has? Certainly does beat the Dutch. Oh, that means you don't like for me to say devil. Does it? Maybe. All right, have it your way. I'll stand for it from you, but nobody else. Not nobody. <laughs> say, did you know that Mac was all through? Through with the book? Yeah, we're done, ain't it, swell? Yes. Uh, well, when are you going away? Huh? Well, when are you leaving us? I ain't. You mean they're going to let you stay? Did Mac say so? What are you talking about, Steve? This is where I live. If it hadn't been for Mac, I would maybe be living in somebody's jail. But he wouldn't stand for it. He'd rather I lived where he lived. Yes, I know that. But you said the book was done, finished. Now what? I don't know. You going to that charity ball tonight? Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Why not? Won't your mom let you? <laughs> oh, I guess she would. You ain't been drinking again and got her sore. Not a drop for three months. Oh, I'm awful glad, Steve. Thanks to you, little sister. Me? I didn't have nothing to do with it. Oh, yes, you did. Ah, you just say that because you like me. Because I... I like you. Gee, you say that as if you mean it. Do I? Peggy, you've never been out west, have you? I've been as far as Jersey City. No, no, I mean way out west. Where men and men? Nah. How would you like to live out there? Why, is Mac going to move? No, he isn't. I am. Oh, you are? No, it's a wonderful place. Miles and miles of open country where you can ride all day long and never hear a sound. Just the singing of the wind in your ears. Yeah, and the moon of the cows. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't care to go out there, I guess. Who, me? Nah, it's too lonesome. Besides, I can get all that kind of stuff I want watching a Western movie. Oh, yes, I, I suppose you can. Hello. Oh, hello, Mac. What are you doing here, Steve? Well, I, I wanted to speak to you about something. Anything important? No, not, not very. Well, I'm going to be rather busy just now. Oh, all right. Well, I'll be back later then. I'll be here. Is anything wrong, Mr. Mack? What? No, no, of course not. You look kind of funny. I thought maybe you was mad or something. No, no, not mad, just tired. Hand me that manuscript, will you? Ah, oh, no, please. Don't read any more today. You make yourself sick working so hard. You certainly take good care of me, don't you? Why not? You took pretty good care of me once. You know, Brett, you've grown amazingly the last couple of months. Yeah, I guess it's because I've been eating regular. Oh, boy, is that a pleasure. 
Does food mean so much to you? Nah, I don't care. Only when I got to go without it for a long time, I kind of miss it. Did you see the flower I put on your desk? Well, thank you. Ah, that's all right. I swiped it. Well, it's very wrong for little girls to swipe things. I suppose you knew that. Well, flowers ain't stealing. They belong to everybody. <laughs> you know, I have a half mind to write a sequel to you. What's a, a, a sequel? It's another book. Oh, is me and Richard going to be in it like we was before? Aye, aye, not me. Is I and Richard going to be in it like we was, huh? Perhaps. He could come back after ten years or so. No, he could, eh? And what would I do? I don't know. Maybe you'd take him back. No, no. No? I, I don't believe you like Richard. Oh, I like him all right. But he never asked me to marry him. That made me kind of sore. Suppose he had asked you. I would have said, Oh, ever since the hours I spent with you, dear heart, the sands of the desert grow more colder, so therefore I will be your bride and the world is mine. Nonsense. You know you don't talk like that. Of course I don't, but it's all right in the book. Go on, tell me about the uh, 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 sequel, yeah. All right. Now, the ten years that Richard's been away, you've never seen him, but you've loved him all that time. Uh-huh. So when he returns again... He admits that he's been wrong. He takes you in his arms like this, and, and he says, I know I'm to blame, dear. I was a young fool. I didn't understand love. I didn't realize the power of it, the beauty and gladness of it. And now I've found you again, and oh, my dear, I love you. I love you. What would you say to that? You're a liar. What? Uh, no, not you. I mean Richard. That's what I'd say to Richard. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that'd finish the sequel right there. Oh, no, please go on. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Simpson? Mrs. Forrester would like to see the young lady, sir. What for? Something about trying on a costume, sir. Oh, I know. It's a dress I'm going to wear the charity benefit tonight. The one I'm going to do the dance in. Oh, well, run along, then. <laughs> All right. So long. See you later, Mr. Mack. <laughs> Yes, Mother? Where is that girl? The brat? Oh, she's around someplace. Why? Mac, do you think it was nice to bring her here? Why not? Mrs. Lawrence said she didn't mind, and I'm interested in watching the brat under these conditions. Well, I hope she doesn't disgrace us. Oh, have you seen Angela yet? Not yet. Well, she's in the drawing room. She said if I saw you to tell you that. Oh, thanks, Mother. I'll see what she wants. Angela? Hello, Mac. Mother said you wanted to see me. Was that the only reason you came? Of course not. What makes you think such a thing? I was just wondering. Mac? Yes? Mac, when are we going to announce our engagement? Well, I don't know, Angela. I hadn't thought about it. Why not this evening? Right now? It's a little sudden, isn't it? Well, there's no time like the present, Mac. Unless you don't want to. Of course I do, but, well, I... I... Oh, well, all right. We'll announce it tonight. You don't seem very keen about it. Mac... I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. About what? I've been hearing some rather nasty rumors lately concerning that girl you've had at the house. The brat? Yes, the brat. What is she doing there, Mac? Why, you know that as well as I do. She's the model for my book. But the book is finished. Oh, I see. You think I should ask her to leave? Yes, for your own good. I don't understand you. Don't you? I suppose you realize that this girl has fallen in love with you. Who said so? Your mother told me. She's quite worried about it. Oh, ridiculous. Perhaps. But I'm not interested in that. What I want to know is, are you in love with her? Angela. Are you, Mac? Of course not. Whatever puts such nonsense into your head? The only reason I'm interested in this girl is that she can supply me with material for my novel. Well, I just wanted to make sure, Mac, because, well, people are beginning to talk. I don't see why. No? You think this creature of yours is an innocent young lamb, don't you? A tender flower blooming in the slums. Well, she isn't. What? She isn't. I've taken the trouble to find out. Do you suppose that the night you found her in the court was the first time she'd been arrested? You... you mean she's been arrested before that? Of course. On what charge? Suppose we call it vagrancy? Angela, are you sure of this? Yes, I am. I've investigated the case thoroughly. I can't believe it. You've got to believe it, Mac. And the girl has got to leave immediately for your own good. Angela, I don't know what to say to you. Don't say anything, dear. I'll send her away tomorrow. I think that would be best. Kiss me, Mac. You know, dear, you are sweet. Oh, Mr. Mac. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes? What Steve is it? Steve is here. He wants to see you, Mr. Mac. Oh. Well, Angela? It's all right, Mac. Run along and speak to him. I'll be here when you come back. Well, all right. I'll be with you in just a few minutes. 
Are you stuck on Mr. Mac, too? I beg your pardon. You hoid me? I asked if you were stuck on him. How does that interest you? It would be kind of funny if we was all stuck on him. Why, everybody loves Mac. Every woman in our set. Does your kind come in sets? <laughs> Sit down and talk to me a while. Now, I ain't supposed to get chummy with no guests here. I only come to do a dance. I see. But you're rather chummy with Mac, aren't you? Why shouldn't I be? Him and me is... Well, he's a great guy, Mac is. How do you mean? Well, he kept me from going to jail one night. I guess you heard about it. And he must have liked me pretty well to do that. And then he gave his ma some money, and she got me a lot of swell clothes. That was another thing he'd done. And I've been living here right in the same house as Steve. And I'm going to keep on living there until he gets used to me. And uh, then I guess we'll get married. Oh. Has he said anything to you about it? No. Nobody said nothing. But him and me has had some talks. Oh, gee, we talk every day. And I told him all about how I came to grow up. And he asked me questions like, what would I do if maybe I was jealous of some dame? And things like that. He don't care nothing for you. I'm the guy. And you... You love him? Love him? Gee, I love him so. I have pains in my sleep. I thought you weren't going to come, Steve. I wasn't, but I decided to leave for the ranch tonight. I've come to say goodbye. So you're really going? Mother gave you the money, I suppose. Yes. How much did she give you? 200 cash and a railroad ticket. Round trip? One way. Well, I hope you make it pay. I'll have to. Keep away from bar rooms and you won't have any trouble. If I don't, you'll never hear of it. Say, before I go, there's something I want to ask you. Yes? This book of yours, I suppose you'll make a fortune on it. The brat? Oh, perhaps. What does the girl get out of it? The time of her young life. Is that all? Certainly. For the past three months, she's had a good home and plenty of clothes, and as a crowning joy, she's making her debut here in society tonight. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, she's free to go where she pleases. Is it quite fair to turn her back to the slums again? Why not? That's where I found her. I know, but perhaps you haven't realized that three months spent in an environment like this means a lot to a youngster like her. She may be different now. They're never different, that kind. She's already different. See here, I don't propose to have my judgment or my actions questioned by anyone, least of all you. You talk as if you were her big brother. Well, I am her big brother. And I'm going to see that she isn't kicked out of here to start. What are you talking about? I'm not kicking her out. I'm letting her go. Where? That's none of your business. And if you don't mind, we'll drop this discussion right here. Excuse me. Steve? Hey, Steve. Oh, hello, Brad. You ain't leaving, are you? Well, yes, I was, but I was going to see you first. Yeah. You got to stick around for my dance. I'll be doing it pretty soon, I guess. <laughs> I'm afraid I won't be able to stay that long. You see, I'm going to catch a train. I'm leaving town. Tonight? Yes. Gee, ain't that fierce. When are you coming back, Steve? Oh, I don't know. Tomorrow? No, not tomorrow. Next week? Next month? No, never. Never? Would you miss me very much if I didn't come back? Well, I never thought about it before, but uh, I guess I would. Mac will, too. Him and me both will. Why do you say that? Well, we just will, that's all. Why do you say Mac and me? Oh, that's a secret, uh, yes. You never used to have secrets from me. I know. This one ain't really a secret. It's just something I think about night times. Oh, but you're going away, so it's all right if I tell you. I think I'm going to get married to Mac. Married? Yeah, that's why I'm so glad I'm going to dance tonight. Because he ain't never saw me do nothing. And he'd be so surprised, he simply won't know what to say. None of these other dames he knows can do one solitary thing. And I guess he'll be some proud of me, all right, all right. <laughs> I bet he'll love me even more after tonight. I'll love you more? Yeah, he does already. Oh, does he? Well, uh, he never come right out and said so, but he does. He couldn't be so good to me and mean nothing. Oh, no, no, of course not. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I know. You think I ain't good enough for him. That's what you think. No, it isn't. Honest? What's your address, Steve? I can write as well later when I get started. And when he asks me, and it's all settled, I'll drop you a postal card. Thanks. Where are you going? Primrose, Wyoming. Where's that? The end of the world. Don't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be lonesome. Yes, I think I will. Well, don't forget, Primrose, write when you like and as often as you like. And if you should ever need me, send a telegram, collect. I won't. I mean, I won't forget. And I guess I won't need nobody. I hope not. I'm going to miss you something terrible, Steve. Really? Cross my heart. Oh, but not for long. I don't know. 
Maybe the next time I see you, I'll be your honest-to-goodness sister. <laughs> well, goodbye. Steve, ain't you gonna kiss me? My old pals don't have to do that. But I want you to. Why do you? What's the difference? Oh, you're the first man I ever asked to kiss me. We've been all the time together, and we talk so much that I guess I know you better than anybody else around here. I've been afraid to say a lot of things to the rest, but it was different with you. I could cuss and swear all I wanted to. And you're wise to so many things that Mac, well, even he ain't wise to. We were just pals. That was it. And I don't know whatever I'm going to do when you're gone. Gee, kid, I... Will you... Will you kiss me now? Sure. Sure I will. Oh. Well? So long, Brad. Steve? Steve? So long. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. It was him. It was Steve all the time, and... And I didn't know it. For station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our play, The Brat, starring Marion Davies with Joel McRae comes to you from the Lux Radio Theater in Hollywood. You will hear the third act shortly. Clothes may not make the man, but in Hollywood, men make the clothes. Hollywood creates more styles than Paris, and a man responsible for many of them is with us tonight. Formerly a painter of murals and portraits, he's now stylist for the stars at Warner Brothers, First National, and Cosmopolitan Studios. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Aura Kelly. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. As one whose job it is to please the eye, it seems very odd to be working for an invisible audience. Before meeting Miss Davies a few years ago, I had been warned she had a wonderful sense of style and I anticipated lots of clashes. But I found her a real person, lovely of face and possessing what every stylist prays for, a superb figure. I've cost him such other notables as Kay Francis, Betty Davis, Ruth Chatterton, Barbara Stanwyck, Loretta Young, Ruby Keeler, and Ginger Rogers. On the screen, you see these stars at their best. In the fitting room, I see them at their worst, tired and harassed after long hours of standing while the fitters fuss and pin. Without exception, their patience is amazing. Kay Francis, like Miss Davies, is one of my favorites, insisting on smart simplicity in her gowns, as I think her next picture, The House of Fashion, will prove. This picture provides my first big opportunity to influence style. I have injected a Persian trend into all the costumes, but try to do it subtly. Both evening and daytime dresses will suggest a trouser effect. Coats will have perfectly straight lines, and with these, they will wear turbans. Small for daytime and large for evening. Nothing will be radical. I have been inclined to underplay styles so that the smart and knowing woman will be able to adopt them. You, as a, as a man of many modes, for stars of many moods, perhaps can tell us who's the best-dressed woman in Hollywood. Well, Kay Francis has been named many times, although Anita Louise has an amazing influence on youthful styles. College girls particularly copy her. Olivia de Havilland is another who must be counted on for future fashion importance. But whatever dresses we make, they must be made to last. Through our experience, we at Warner Brothers have learned that as far as washables are concerned, Lux flakes can always be counted on to keep colors fresh and fabrics looking like new. As for fall styles, I think you're going to see a tendency towards simplicity, thanks in part to the movies. Lion and Concha give the best effects and incidentally enable the public to apply the styles easily. My advice to you is concentrate on Lion. Thank you. Thank you. And now for the last act of The Brat, starring Marion Davies. Late the same evening, in the living room of the Forrester home, Timpson is drawing the shades, 
preparatory to retiring for the night. As he turns from the window, he's surprised to find Steve, grip in hand, framed in the archway. Good evening, Timson. Why, Mr. Steve. Anybody home? No, sir, they haven't returned from the benefit yet. Did you change your mind about going away, Mr. Steve? No, but the train wouldn't hang around the station till I figured the whole thing out, so I missed it. You did now. Hmm. And you're home for the night. <laughs> Wrong again. I came back to ask you to do me a favor. I don't know whether you know it or not, but tomorrow the brat gets canned. What? Canned, sir? Yeah, Mac's going to throw her out in the street again. Oh, but he can't do that, sir. He not only can, but he will. See here, Tim. You've got to do something for me. I've got $200 here, and I want you to take 100 of it and give it to her just before she goes. It'll keep her until she gets work. You needn't say where it came from. Will you do this for me? Very well, indeed, sir. Good. That settles the whole matter. And will you be leaving at this hour, Mr. Steele? Well, there's a train out at daylight. Then why don't you take a little bit of a rest up in your room, sir? It's nice and warm there, and no one will be a bit the wiser. Uh, that's a good idea, Tim. But don't tell anyone I'm here. I wouldn't have them know I came back for a million. There's the bell, sir. You'd better hurry up. Remember, not a word to a soul until I'm gone. No, sir, I won't say one word. Hello, Jimson. Well, well, are you all by yourself, miss? Yeah, I didn't like the joint much, so I scrammed. And what was the trouble, miss? Why didn't you like it? They wouldn't let me do my dance. Ah, do you tell me so? And I practiced it all morning, making believe the phonograph was an orchestra. Ah, monsieur, between fooling yourself and being fooled be your friend. Tis a queer world. Let me take your coat, miss. No, please. Leave me wear it for a while. It's the last chance I'll ever get. How's that, miss? Nobody knows it yet. But I'm going away tomorrow. You made up your mind kind of suddenly. Well, I do things that way and then think them over later. Sometimes I'm wrong, but I'm most usual wrong. Oh, yes, miss. Timpson, how far is it to Primrose? And what did you be doing in Primrose? Steve's there and I want to go to him. Oh, glory be, but I'm glad to hear you say that, no. You, you like him, Tim? Ah, faith I do. He's a fine lad. Ah, why didn't you say so? I thought you was in with the rest of them around here, always treating him like he was in a way. No, he'll not be in their way any longer, miss. No, I won't neither. You only like him. I, I love him. And it's too late. You love him? Yeah. But I handed him such a line of talk about the other that he shut his trap and beat it. And who was the other one? Ah, oh, that part of it's awful silly. At first I was crazy about Mac. What, Mr. Macmillan? Well, I wasn't real crazy, but I thought I was. You know how them kids get daffy over the fellas in the movies? That was me. I didn't know no better. But I do now. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. How sure? I can't tell you without swearing. I beg your pardon, Mr. Forrester. Yes, what is it? You're wanted on the telephone, sir. Judge Henry calling. Oh, thank you. Hello? This is Macmillan, Judge Henry. How are you? Did you get my message? Yes, I called earlier this evening. Oh, you did? Well, I wanted to know about her, Judge Henry. You see, I feel sort of personally responsible for the girl. And if she has to be sent to a reform school or anything... What? What do you mean? Oh, I see. Then there was never anything against her. Oh. What are you doing? Everyone's asking. All right, Judge. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all. Thank you very much. Good night. I didn't know you were on the phone, Mac. I was speaking to Judge Henry. Oh. Angela, where did you get your information about that girl? Well, why? Why, from a private detective. You're lying. What? You lied to me this afternoon. Judge Henry just told me that girl was never arrested in her life. Well, what of it? Then you admit you lied. If you must know, yes. You didn't believe me when I told you I didn't love her, did you? You thought you had to blacken her character to make sure. Mac, listen to me. You must have known the truth about this would come out sometime. I didn't care. I see. And that's why you were so anxious to announce our engagement. You played your cards very well, Angela. Oh, please, Mac. Don't talk like that. Don't you understand it? It was because I love you. Yes, you had a peculiar way of showing it. You, you don't really love this girl. What difference does that make now? Can I take that bundle downstairs for you, Alana? Nah, don't bother, Timson. I'll do it myself. Hello. Oh. oh, I didn't hear you come in, Mr. Mac. Where are you going? Me? I'm going back where I started from. What have you got in that bundle? My clothes. Anything else? You didn't give me nothing else, did you? No. And there ain't nothing else in here. So you're leaving us. Don't you like it here? Nah, it's too frosty.
This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Marion Davies and Brian Ahern in Peg of My Heart. Lux presents Hollywood. This is your program, ladies and gentlemen, made possible by your regular purchases of our products. It comes to you with the good wishes of our sponsors, who tonight bring you Marion Davies, Brian Ahern, Benita Hume, J. Farrell McDonald, Eileen Pringle, Gerald Oliver Smith, and Edgar Norton in Peg of My Heart. Our guests are Earl Johnson, famous trainer of motion picture dogs, and Marjorie Williams, director of the Hollywood Studio Club. Conducting our orchestra is Louis Silvers. And now, here's our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Marion Davies has given Hollywood two things for which the town may be thankful. A good fellowship, which has inspired so much loyalty, and a great white landmark on the ocean front, her home at Santa Monica Beach. A quiet little gathering there may mean from 30 to 1,000 guests and may include princes, giants of business, statesmen, and the nation's leading social lights, all being quite themselves under the spell of their charming and unassuming hostess. I've seen prominent ambassadors play ping-pong in the cellar and a world-renowned scientist romping with Marion's four dachshunds. She's forbidden me to mention that she's active in a number of charities, so just pretend I didn't mention it. Aside from that, she grows hundreds of flowers and engages in the business affairs of Cosmopolitan Studios. Tonight, she plays a role in which she always excels. Peg in Peg of My Heart. Opposite her is that very resolute young man, Brian Ahern. For years, Brian struggled against becoming a star. It all began when, at the age of three, his mother practically thrust him on the stage. Brian showed his displeasure by howling throughout the entire performance. Still a rebel, he was enrolled in a London dramatic school at 10. His fellow students included an upperclassman, whom he recalls as a brash youngster with large ears and an assertive ambition. Once when Brian sent his autograph book to Reginald Owen, he found upon its return that the boy with the big ears had intruded his own signature. The uninvited autograph read, Noel Coward. Currently starred in The Great Garrick, you hear Brian on this stage as Sir Gerald Markham. Benita Hume comes to us as Ethel, J. Farrell MacDonald as Patrick Seamus O'Connell, Eileen Pringle as Mrs. Chichester, Gerald Oliver Smith as Alaric, and Edgar Norton of the original stage cast as Jarvis. In the Lux Radio Theater production, Peg of My Heart, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. village off the west coast of Ireland. A narrow cobble street runs the length of the waterfront, where a score of tiny fishing boats bob merrily at anchor. One of these bears the painted legend, Peg of My Heart. On its slippery deck, Patrick Seamus O'Connell empties the day's catch into baskets. His daughter, Peg, in boy's clothing, lends a willing hand, tossing the baskets into a donkey cart. Oh, sure, and the cart is piled full, Father. It'll hold one more, I'm thinking. Here you be. Oh, uh, sure, and it was a grand catch we had today, wasn't it, Father? I've seen more fishes in my lifetime. Go along with you now and be taking them up to the icing station and then go home and get supper. Sure, Father. Now, where's Michael? Michael, me lad. Here, boy. Yes. Oh, so there you are. Up on the cart with you now. Go on, up you go. And mind, don't step on the fish. Goodbye, Father. Is it long you'll be? No longer than it takes the nets to dry. Your supper will be waiting then. Get up, sweetheart, get up. There's a light in your eyes, sweetheart, darling. Boy, boy, I say boy. Whoa. Is it me you're talking to, mister? Yes, I'm... Uh... Oh, who is it then that you're calling boy? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I thought, uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> sure, and there's no harm done. Be like it with me past the cast of mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I imagine so. And what can I be doing for you? Uh, well, I've just come from London. I'm looking for a Mr. O'Connell. Patrick Seamus O'Connell. Oh, 
you now. Well, that'll be him down there on the deck of the Peggy Me Hearts. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, no trouble at all, lad. Get up, sweetheart. Get on with you. Get down there. Good evening. It is that. Were you looking for someone? Are you Mr. O'Connell? I am. Patrick Seamus is the name. Ah, then you're the one I want. Uh, you married Heather Kingsnorth, didn't you? I did. But she's been gone these 14 years. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, my name is Gerald Markham. I'm the executor of the Kingsnorth estate. I suppose you knew that your wife's father was dead. I did not. When did they hang him? <laughs> I'm happy to say that Mr. Kingsnorth died in his bed, like an honest English gentleman, and of a very common ailment, old age. Uh, you'll be pleased to learn that his granddaughter, your daughter Margaret, inherits his entire estate. What's that? Squire Kingsnorth has left your daughter two million pounds. Two million pounds? Holy saints. Of course, there are certain conditions. Oh, of course there would be. What conditions? Well, first, Miss O'Connell will have to spend three years with the Chichester family. Who? Uh, Mrs. Chichester is a distant relation of the Kingsnorths. And she'll stay with them? Uh, for three years. Hmm. Be the way of making a lady of her, I suppose. Well, let's call it education. Uh huh. Hmm. Well, it will do Peg no harm. There's maybe one or two things I couldn't teach her myself. But mind you, I'll not live with Mr. Chis Chichester. Oh, no, 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 of course not. Uh, as a matter of fact, the second condition states that you are not to be with your daughter. Oh, does it? Not to be with Peg for three years? It's more than that, Mr. O'Connell. The separation is to be complete and permanent. Permanent? That's forever, ain't it? Yes. I have a paper here that you ought to sign. You can keep your paper, Mr. Markham, and your conditions with it. And you can take yourself off this boat as fast as your legs can carry you. Go on. Oh, oh wait, please. Uh, these aren't my conditions, Mr. O'Connell. I'm only acting as, uh, well, uh, as a messenger, you might say. And it's sorry news you're bringing, too. I'll have none of it. I can understand your attitude. But um, do you think that you're being quite fair to your daughter? I do, that. She's happy here, and I'm happy, too. I don't... Glory be. They're ringing the bell again. What does it mean? Has something happened? Aye. David! David Clark! Aye, Patrick. Who was it, David? What's amiss? Jenny Fogarty's boat, the Sheila. She went down off the reef. All hands lost. <laughs> All hands lost. Glory be. And himself leaving behind a widow and child. It's a sad day for them, I'm thinking. It might have been you, Mr. O'Connell. What's that? What's that you're saying? I say it might have been you. What would happen to your daughter? Aye. Aye. You're right, Mr. Markham. Well? I... I never... I never never gave it a thought before. You'll come to the house tonight, Mr. Markham? We'll... We'll talk it over then. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sit down now, Father. Father! Eh? Your supper be as oh. cold as a clam. I'm sorry, Peg. I... Uh, I was thinking. Is there something on your mind, Father? You've been acting mighty strange, you have. Oh, it is nothing much. I... I... I was only thinking that it's... It's mighty little pleasure you have in this life, Carol. Me? Oh, what do you mean? Well, uh, living, living this kind of a life uh, with an old man, you must be getting tired of me. Tired of you? What talk have you? I'd not change you for a million pounds. Ah, but would you change me for two million pounds? I would not. Not for all the money in the world. Oh, Peg, darling, you... <laughs> sure, it's a great mistake you'd be making, too, holding on to an old man like me when you might be hobnobbing with all the lords and ladies of London. Father, are you daft? What talk is this? Peg. Peg, dear. There's something I... Now, who's that? The latch is off. Let you be coming in. Oh, good evening. Oh, come in. Come in, Sir Gerald. Oh, thank you. Sir Gerald. Oh, saints preserve us. And me talking to him to stay like he was me own equal. <laughs> this is my daughter, Peg, Sir Gerald. Oh, how do you do, Peg? 
Pleased to meet you, Your Honor. I mean, <laughs> Your Highness, I'm, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> What's good is here, girl? Well, it's a great honor to meet a Sir... Uh, sir Gerald, Sir. Oh, not really. There are baronets all over in England, thicker than plums in a pudding. We never had a plum pudding, Your Highness. That's true enough. But you will now, Peg. Sit down, Sir Gerald. Thank you. Father. Father, what is it? You're an heiress, Peg. What? An heiress. Squire King's not the diet he has. And he left you all the money you want. And, and everything that goes with it. Two million pounds, to be exact. Two million pounds? Ah, think of that now. And it's all yours to spend as you want. Ah, oh, then I'll be getting you the red flannels that they've been leaning against your cart the next winter. And I'll buy a brass collar for Michael with his name written on it. And a dress for myself. Uh, uh, maybe two dresses. And some new boots to go fishing in. You'll not be going fishing. It's in England you'll be living. England, is it? And when do we go? Immediate. You must be getting about your packing, Peggy. It'll be the morning train you're leaving. Oh, glory be. Then yourself had best be packing, too. No, never mind about me. I'm not going, would you? Not going? Then I'm not going either. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not going, would you? Just now. Why not? Why, uh, oh, you see, there's, there's this and that to be attended to. And well, I... uh, when will you come? Mm, it will not be so long. But when? Well, uh, soon. All right. But you'll be coming, or I'll, I'll be coming back, and that's flat. Go on now and attend to your packing. Will, uh, will you be staying, Your Honor? Just for a moment. I'll see you the first thing in the morning. Good night, then. And thank you, Your Honor. You're not being fair to her, Mr. O'Connell. Do you think she'd go if she thought she'd never be seeing me? It's the only way. What are you going to do? I'll write her I've been delayed. And then what? I'll write her again. And after that? Oh, I'll write... I, I, I'll write her I'm dead. That is, I'll have somebody write her I'm dead. That's hardly a solution. It's worse than telling her now. But even if she would go, which she wouldn't, could break both our hearts, the pattern. It's breaking yours now. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm much older, and I'm, I'm used to it. And, and here's your bundle, and here's your grip. Are you ready now? All ready, Father. The cart's waiting, Peg. In a minute, the General. <laughs> and here's Michael. You'll be taking him, too. Get up on the cart, Michael. Oh, Father. Well, well, girl. Father, I... I can't say goodbye. We'll not be mentioning it then. And, and we'll not be crying either, will we, Peg? No, I, I'll not be crying. Sure, what's there to cry about? Nothing. Nothing. It's a, it's a very happy, happy occasion. Me cold was a little worse this morning. So was mine. It come on me all of a sudden. All ready, Mr. O'Connell? Coming. Oh, Father, call me that name again so I'll feel warm till you come for me. Call me your name for me. Peg. Peg me heart. Oh, Father. Now go out. Go on. Drive on. Drive on. Quick, Sir Gerald. Goodbye, Mr. O'Connell. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, Peg. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Father. All right, Peg, this is it. You mean this is the house that I'm to stay in? Of course. Come on. Oh, glory be. Shoot is large enough for a regiment, horses and all. <laughs> oh, you'll get used to it. Here we are. Oh, saints above. Look at the knocker. Sure, they're mighty careful at the knuckles in England, aren't they, Your Honor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Are you tired, Peg? Divil a bit. Let's start now for somewhere else, Your Honor. Timbuktu, for instance. Oh, you're not nervous, are you? No, not a bit. Uh, that's why I can't understand why my knees is knocking. <laughs> oh, uh, good morning, Jarvis. Oh, good morning, Sir Gerald. Come right in, Peg. Thank you. Uh, a nasty day, sir. Hmm, storm coming on, I think. Uh, yes, sir. You'll find the family in the drawing room, sir. Thanks. This way, Peg. We might have told you how to be this Hello. Hello. Oh, Sir Gerald. Hello, Hello Jerry. Come right in, Peg. Uh, this is your aunt, Mrs. Chichester. 
I'm pleased to meet you, ma'am, I'm sure. How do you do? Huh? And uh, this is Miss Ethel Chichester and Mr. Alaric Chichester. How do you do? How do you do? Hello. Um, what did you say your name was, young lady? I didn't say, but it's Peg. And this is me dog, Michael. Uh, say hello to the lady, Michael. <laughs> stop it, stop it, Jarvis, Jarvis. Pull him off, you dear. Pull him off. Down, Michael, down, boy. Uh, <laughs> sure. He was only trying to be friends, ma'am. You called, madam. Yes, I did. Take that dog away. Oh, no, ma'am. Not Michael. You can't take Michael away from me. He was given to me by my father. Take it away. And never let it inside the house again. Well, if you don't want Michael inside the house, you don't want me inside the house. Peg, please, let's not have an argument. I'm not having an argument. I'm making a statement. I don't know these people two minutes and they want to take me dog away from me. Well, you must try to do whatever your aunt asks you. Now, let him go, Peg. You can see him whenever you want to. Well, is he going to be in the house? Oh, of course he is. All right, then. Take him, Jarvis. Yes, madam. You'll be very nice to him, won't you? Yes, miss. And give him a mutton bone. He loves mutton bones. Certainly, miss. Goodbye, Michael. I'm sure he'll be well taken care of, Peg. Well, he'd better be. That's all I have to say. Come here to me. Yes, ma'am. And don't call me ma'am. No, ma'am. Aunt, I mean. Aunt, not aunt. Yes, ma'am. Sit down, please. All right. Thank you. I said sit, not sprawl. Look at your cousin Ethel. Me cousin Ethel? Oh, her. Is she my cousin? Yes, I hope you have no objection. Oh, not the least. Now, Margaret, what I would like to... Uh... Margaret. <laughs> my name ain't Margaret. My name is Peg. That's only a corruption. We shall call you Margaret. All right, but don't forget if I forget the answer. Don't blame me, will you? My father always calls me Peg. We have very little interest in what your father calls you. You will kindly leave him out of the conversation. Then it's all I will leave him out of... No temper, if you please. You are here to learn how to conduct yourself. You may go to your room now, Margaret. Jarvis will show you the way. Margaret. Oh, it's me, you mean. <laughs> now, there you are, Aunt. <laughs> you see, when you didn't say a pig, yes, I... Yes, I do. Go to your room, please. Very well, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Well, a nice package you've delivered, Sir Gerald. Oh, she's not so bad. She's really very sweet. You'll have to be patient with her for a while, that's all. Patient? Oh, it's going to take more than patience to make anything of her. <laughs> oh, I say, Ethel, don't be so hard. After all, you know we are being paid for it. <laughs> Am I right, Jerry? Quite right, Alaric. I, um, I imagine you might be able to use the additional income. Use it? Oh, <laughs> oh, I think that's very good. That's really amusing. Especially since we have no other income. Alaric, don't be vulgar. Well, it's too humiliating to be paid for keeping someone in the house. Well, of course, she's not to know that. She's a guest here, and she has to be treated as one. Hey, hey was that Thamba? Uh, I see, uh, Mrs. Chichester. Well, Jarvis? Is, is the young lady just stay, Mrs. Chichester? Of course she is. Well, I unpacked her things, madam, but she's packed them again and she's on her way out. What? Where is she? Which way did she go? She's the back way. I think we've got to stop her. I'll get her. Wait no, here. There you are. I knew we'd lose all the money. Hey! Hey, where are you? Shut it out, shut it out. Hey, come away from that door. Shut it out, shut out the storm. Yeah, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. Don't be frightened. It's only a summer storm. Oh, sure, in summer or winter, they shrivel me up. Oh! Stop it now. Get a grip on yourself. I can't. When I hear the great crashes of thunder, I remember all my sins. Now sit down. Go on, sit down. There now. It's all over. Oh, thank heaven for that. Where were you just going? I was going out, I was. Out of this house and back to me father. Oh, but you can't do that, Peg. Oh, yes, I can. I'm not wanted here. That's easy to see. Oh, but you are wanted, Peg. I, uh, I happen to know. And who is it wants me? Not old Mrs. Chichester. And not me cousins either. Them with their sour faces. I'm not used to sour faces, I'm not. Well, then, I want you to stay. Will you do it for me, Peg? You? Oh, Your Honor. You've been very kind to me, you have, and that's the truth. But they're not going to make a lady out of me if I can help it. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. That's what my father says. And that's what I am. A sow's ear. I don't agree with you, Peg. I don't care whether you do not. I'm a sow's ear, well, I am. if you insist. Thank you. But you're going to stay? Well, uh, seeing as it's you who's asking me, Your Honor. It is. And you mustn't call me Your Honor. My name is Jerry. Jerry. Do you want me to call you Jerry? Well, why not? We're friends, aren't we? Oh, yes, but, uh, but we're not as good friends as all that. <laughs> well, we will be soon. You're very sure? I'll stake my life on it. Would you now? <laughs> then you don't value it much. Oh, yes, I do. Perhaps more than I ever did before. Margaret? Margaret? Oh, glory be, it's herself. I see. Here she is, Mater. Margaret, where were you going? Sure, and I was going out, I was. But I changed my mind now because only Jerry here asked me to. Margaret? Jerry? Oh, I say. 
why shouldn't I call him Jerry? He's my friend, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> You have just heard Act One of Plague of My Heart. In just a few moments, we will continue with Act Two of our play, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. But now it's intermission time in the Lux Radio Theater. While we are waiting for Act Two, we want you to go with us to an attractive home in Westwood. There we meet an important Hollywood lady, one of our few women executives. She's settling down for a visit with her sister, just arrived from the East for a month's stay. Now, Lou, tell me all about it. How does it feel to be a married woman? Oh, just wonderful, sis. Harry's an angel. You'll love him. <laughs> Will I? Oh, yes. He's the most perfect husband. Mm. Phrases your biscuits. Men broken chairs. Ken's the thinnest, I suppose. Does he wash dishes, too? Oh, certainly not. I'm the chief cook and dishwasher in our house. Well, your hands don't show it. I'll say that. Of course they don't, sis. I'm very particular about the way I wash dishes. I never use anything but Lux Flakes. I've heard so much about Lux around the studio. But I don't know much about dishwashing. Is it so wonderful for that, too? It is wonderful, sis. Now, I've been washing dishes for months, and my hands haven't once felt the teeniest bit rougher chapped. They say Lux hasn't any of the harmful alkali that some soaps have. That's why it doesn't dry your skin. Your hands really are nice, Lou. Nice enough to kiss. And tell me, honest now, doesn't Harry... Yes, he does, silly. And I hope he'll always want to. And now, let's go back to our play. Mr. DeMille sets the scene for us. We continue with Peg of My Heart, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern with Benita Hume. One month has passed since Peg first came to the Chichester home. A month of training and study that's been all work and no play. In the living room, we find Ethel and Christopher Brent, a friend of the family. Brent has been a frequent visitor... And Peg has come to know him and to dislike him intensely. He's just been shown in by Jarvis. And coming quickly across the room, takes Ethel's hand. Ethel, how are you, darling? Oh, I'm all right. Glad to see me. Mm-hmm. Why not? Where is everybody? Mother's lying down and Alaric's around someplace. And your little Irish cousin? Oh, my little Irish cousin. You seem very interested in her. <laughs> child amuses me. Are you sure that's all? Oh, Ethel, please. I refuse to be drawn into an argument about anything so ridiculous. I'm sorry, Chris. It's just nerves. Things have been rather trying this past month. Yes, for me too. Ethel, I'm at the crossroads. What do you mean? Well, it's the end between me and my wife. We quarreled again last night about you. Oh, how interesting. She's heard some talk about us. She put the worst construction on it naturally. And what do you intend doing? Separate, of course. She won't give me a divorce. But I'm leaving for France tonight. Alone? Yes. Unless someone goes with me. Oh, naturally. Ethel, if my wife does set me free, will you marry me? I... I don't know, Chris. I want you, Ethel. I need you. Mm, until you grow tired of me, as you're tired of your wife? I'll never grow tired of you. I love you, Ethel. You know that, don't you? Don't, Chris. Why not? No, no, please. Darling, I... I... Hello. Oh. Oh, don't mind me. I was told to come down here and study. And was it absolutely necessary to choose this room? Well, it's as good as any other, I guess. But I won't be in your way. I'll just sit off in the corner and you'll never even know I'm there. <laughs> Chris, Oh, it's, I... it's quite all right. I, I was just about to leave anyway. Oh, were you? Well, I hope you're not leaving on my account, but uh, goodbye, Mr. Brent. Goodbye. <laughs> I come in. Oh, what do you want? Oh, just to say good night. It's a nice room you have, Ethel. Well, I'd feel terrible if it didn't meet with your approval. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, aren't you my model? Oh, good night, please. Oh, Ethel, please don't be angry with me. I didn't mean it, Ethel. Ethel, won't you make friends with me? We have nothing in common. Well, that doesn't prevent us from being decent to each other. I'll meet you three quarters of the way if you'll only show one generous feeling toward me. You would if you knew what was in my mind. <laughs> You're a strange creature. Ah, you got us mixed up. I'm not the strange one. What? Oh, I watch and listen. And listen to you. You turn your face to the world as much as to say, aren't I the ears ago and sweet-tempered, calm young lady? And you're not quite that, are you? Well, what am I? Of course, 
You've got the breed and then the beautiful manners. But you have a temper. And it's a beautiful temper. It's a shame for you not to let it out in the daylight so that everybody can see it. But you can't, can you? Because it's not good form. And with all your fine advantages, you're not very happy, are you? Are you? No. Neither I'm... am I in this house. Ethel, I'd like very much to ask you something. Well, what is it? Do you know anything about love? What? Have you ever been in love? Oh, no, I haven't. Have you ever thought about it? Um. What do you think about it? Very little. Oh, you're wrong. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. To love a good man who loves you. A man who makes you hot and cold. Burning like fire one minute. And freezing like ice the next. Who makes your heart leap with happiness when he comes near you. And ache with sorrow when he goes away from you. Oh, it's mighty disturbing. Well, how do you know all this? Oh, uh, I, uh, I read about it in a book. Oh, I see. Don't you like men, Ethel? Not much. But you like Mr. Brent, don't you? Certainly I do. He's a very old friend of the family. He has a wife. Well, what about it? Oh, nothing, Ethel. But tell me this. Is it customary for English husbands to go around kissing other women? I suppose you're referring to what you saw downstairs today. Well, in a way, uh, yes. Will you kindly have the decency to keep your observations to yourself? Oh, sure, please, Ethel. Don't be angry with me. I only wanted to tell you something. I don't care to hear it. Now go away. And just for a change, try minding your own business. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Jerry! Is it you? Oh, hello, Peg. Hello. Sit down, Jerry. Oh, can't stay. Just dropped in to ask you something. Yes? Well, there's a dance tonight at the country club. Would you like to go? Would I like? Oh, indeed I would. <laughs> Good. We'll have to ask your aunt, of course. Ah, uh, would we? Oh, but she'll never let me, Jerry. Oh. She won't, I know. I don't let's take any chances. Let's go to the dance tonight, and I'll ask her tomorrow morning. Oh, Peg, well, that's not fair. I know, but it's a dance. And if you think I'm going to let it get by me, you're very much mistaken. <laughs> when the lights are all out and they're all asleep, I'll creep down the stairs and meet you at the foot of the path. And if it goes against your tender conscience to take me, I'll take you. <laughs> That's how we'll settle that. <laughs> oh, but there may not be any occasion to do any such thing. Your aunt may be delighted. Delighted? <laughs> sure. She doesn't know the meaning of the word. But why shouldn't she let you go? After all, I'm an old friend of the family. And, uh, well, we are good friends, too. Aren't we, Peg? I... I guess we are, Jerry. Did you ever hear what Tom Moore wrote about friendship? No. Would you like to hear what Tom Moore wrote about friendship? I'd love to. All right. There's a tune that goes with it. But I won't sing the words. Why not? Well, it wouldn't be fair to Tom Moore. <laughs> it's about a girl, that is, who built a shrine... And she thought that the best thing in the world to put in it was an image of friendship. You see, she was like you. She thought that there was nothing in the world as nice as friendship. Yes? Yes. And this is what happened to her. She flew to a sculptor who sat down before her. A friendship the fairest his art could invent. But so cold and dull that this useful adorer said plainly, that was not the friendship she meant. Oh, never, she cried, could I think of enshrining an image whose looks are so joyless and dim. But yon little Cupid, Miss Rose's reclining, we'll make, if you please, sir, a friendship of him. So the bargain was struck with a little god laden. She joyfully flew to her shrine in the grove. Farewell, said the sculptor. You're not the first maiden who came but for friendship and took away love. Now, where in the world did you learn that? Oh, my father taught me that. Tom Moore's my father's prayer book. Who came but for friendship and took away love. Well, that's happened to a lot of men, I think. To a lot of women, I think. Has it ever happened to you, Peg? To me? Uh, well, no. Uh, maybe it would sometime if... Oh, if I was different. But, oh, I'm just an Irish nobody. Oh, don't say that. Oh, I'm sure there's a little something good in me. But the bad little something always beats the good little something out, so it does. Well, you'll have to put a rain on the bad something, then. <laughs> so I will. But would you mind very much if it had just one more spurt before I killed it altogether? What do you mean? <laughs> I want to go to the dance. It's the last bad thing I'll ask you to let me do. 
I behave like a saint from heaven after that. Well, I still think you should ask your aunt. All right, I will then. But yes or no, I'm going to that dance. <laughs> Happy Peg? Happy? Sure, the whole world's going around with this one wall. And I'm going around with it, too. I'm dizzy, I am. Shall we sit down? Ah, oh, no, it'll be over so soon. An hour more, and I'll be creeping back like a thief in the night. You shouldn't have come here, really. Don't I know it. And isn't that why it's such fun? <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Oh, yes, here we are. Sure, it's been a glorious night, Jerry. I'm glad, Peg. All the while I'm supposed to have been asleep upstairs, I've been stealing the time. I'm a thief, I am. Well, you're a lovely thief. The sweetest. What? You'd better go in. I know that. But what are you going to say to me? I think it might be better to say in daylight. But why in the daylight? With the beautiful bright moon so high in the heaven. I'll go on now. Someone may hear us. I suppose you do know best, but that's a magnificent moon. Well, good night, Jerry. Good night, Peg. Oh, Jerry. What is it? I, I heard something. There's someone over there by the tree. Do you see him? Yes, it looks like Bradley. Bradley? Who's he? Christopher Brent's chauffeur. Oh, of course it is. That's Brent's car at the end of the drive. Now, what's he doing here at this hour? Sure, and I think I have a very good idea. Good night, Jerry. Peg, wait. I can't, I can't. I've got to go in. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Peg. Who's there? Is, is that you, Ethel? What are you doing down here in the dark? I could ask the same of you. What are you doing with your hat and coat on at this time of the night? And a traveling case with you, too. Go to your room, please. What are you going away? Keep your voice down. Mr. Brent's car is out there. Were you going away with Brent, will you? Answer me, Ethel. Yes, I am. We're taking the boat to France. Oh, no, you're not. You're not going out of this house tonight. If I have to wake everyone in, it'll wait them. They can't stop me. Nothing can stop me now. And what do you suppose you'd be going to? Awake and sleep in purgatory, sure. Get out of my way. He has a wife, Ethel. He hates her. And I hate this. Is it my fault she won't give him a divorce? And is that what he told you? And did you believe it? It's him that won't get the divorce. He wants her money. And he wants you. And he can't have both without lying to you. You're mad. It's the truth, I'm telling you. You've got to believe me, Ethel. You leave me alone. No, you're not getting in the car tonight. And I'm the one who'll see to it. Come back here. Come back. Bradley. Bradley. Good evening, Miss Ethel. It's not Miss Ethel. Where's Mr. Brent? Why, well, he's at the Boar's Head Tavern, Miss, but I... Is he waiting for her? Well, Miss, I, I... Then you can take me to him. But Miss Ethel is No, Miss to... Ethel ain't coming. Now get in there and drive. Go on before I blacken your two sneaky eyes. Yes, Miss. Who is it? Is it you, Ethel? Ethel, why don't you... Oh. You can close the door, please. What are you doing here? I came to see you, Mr. Brent. Yes, that's obvious. There must be some other explanation. Won't you sit down? Oh, no. I can tell you what I think of you standing on my own two feet. Really, now? And I'll thank you not to interrupt me. It'll take me a long time, it will, thinking up bad words enough to describe the likes of you. Yes. Oh, uh, come in, Ethel. We have a visitor. I thought she'd be here. You may go now, please. And leave you to go gallivanting off with this parlor snake? Oh, no. I came here to tell him what I think of him. And I'm staying here till I've finished. You stay out of my business. Oh, was it a snake I called you, Mr. Brent? Well, you're worse than a snake and a whole foot lower. A decent girl wouldn't lower herself to step on you. But you fooled Miss Ethel here, and now you're going to tell her the truth. Did you hear what I said? Get out. Oh, let her alone, Ethel. She's very amusing. The whole situation is amusing. Chris. Quiet. <laughs> amusing, is it? Well, then why don't you answer the door? We're found here. Don't let them hear you. Ethel, get into the other room. What? Go on, I can take care of this. What are you going to do? Go on now, please, go on. Come in, please. Are you mad? Is this him, Mrs.? Yes. Good evening, Chris. Oh, how do you do, Claire? Oh, Claire, is it? Yes, Claire Brent. I'm Mr. Brent's wife. 
I, uh, I don't believe I know the two gentlemen, Claire. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Doyle and Mr. Flint. Detectives. They didn't come to pay a social call. Well, have you gentlemen seen all you wish? I think it'll do. It'll stand in any divorce court. Thank you. Claire, you can't do this. What's your name, young lady? Don't answer them. And why not? I'm not ashamed of it. My name's Peg O'Connell. Thank you. Is that all, gentlemen? That's all. Good night, Chris. Well, that's that. I suppose you know what you've done, Miss O'Connell. Yes, Mr. Brent. I've shown you up for what you are. Ethel, you can come out now. Peg. Oh, Peg. Well, there now, it's all right. Everything's all right. But it isn't. What for you, it isn't. Don't you understand? The newspapers, they'll name you as a correspondent. They'll think that you were the one who was... Oh, let them think what they want. There's only two people in this whole wide world I care a hang about. One of them is my father. Oh, he'll know it's a lie. And the other one, he'll believe whatever is in his heart to believe. Oh, now I think we'd best be getting home. <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Down comes the curtain on Act Two of our play, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. One of the characters in our play is a four-footed gentleman named Michael. And for the next moment or two, before going into Act Three of Peg of My Heart, we'll hear about Michael's Hollywood relations, the dogs of motion pictures. I don't know what a dog's vision of paradise may be, but Hollywood comes pretty close to being a canine heaven. The home of practically every star has two or three tail waggers. Many of our celebrities raise prize dogs as a hobby. <laughs> Charlie Ruggles raises them as a business. And here you'll find catering shops, dude ranches, haberdashery stores, beauty parlors, and expert medicals, all dedicated to a happy, healthy Fido. Our guest, Earl Johnson, has trained motion picture dogs for many years, including Flush, whom you saw in the Barracks of Wimple Street. His most famous star is the German shepherd, Lightning, hero of such films as Wings in the Dark, The Case of the Howling Dog, and White Fang. And now, Mr. Johnson... Just what does it take to be a Clark Gable in dogdom? Same two qualities, Mr. DeMille, the human stars must have. Intelligence and personality. Lots of dogs could be taught to do everything that Lightning does. But his success is due chiefly to the personality he exhibits in doing his tricks. In the days of silent pictures, when a dog was playing a scene, all a trainer had to do was speak commands. This, of course, can't be done in talking pictures. How, then, do you convey to a dog what you want him to do? Well, before a scene is shot... The dog is rehearsed, just like any other member of the cast. But naturally, when the scene is being played, the dog can't understand the dialogue, so he must get his direction from the trainer. The trainer stands near the camera and tells the dog exactly what to do through certain simple movements of his hands. But does Lightning know when he's acting and when he isn't? Yes. He'll attack a man and rip his clothing to shreds and perform with all the viciousness of a wolf. But as soon as the scene is finished... He'll run up to the same man, wag his tail, and lick his hands like a puppy. And he'll never let his teeth so much as scratch the skin of the man he's attacking. All that, of course, being the result of careful training. A dog's career in motion pictures is much the same as a man's. If he's to get an important part, he must pass a screen test. I tested 11 dogs before I found Lantloper, the can terrier who performs in the Buccaneer. <laughs> he even walked the plank for me. Yes, famous dogs like that. Have their own dressing rooms, their own doubles and stand-ins, and receive hundreds of fan letters. Lightning's stand-in is his own son, Lightning Jr., who's learning the picture business in that manner. And if a dog has a feature part in a film, he's hired like any other important player, through the casting office. If he's an extra, so to speak, he's hired through the property department. What can you tell us about Lightning's rival for screen popularity, the wirehead terrier, Mr. Astor? who appears with William Powell and Myrna Loy in the Thin Man pictures. Mr. Astor is owned by Henry East. The dog's real name is Skippy. And you'll see him again in the new film, The Awful Truth. 
this time under the name of Mr. Smith. Skippy is undoubtedly one of the smartest dogs ever seen in films. In his fondest possession, though he's received many more valuable gifts from the stars with whom he's worked, is a little rubber mouse named Oslo. Mr. East gives Oslo to Skippy to chew on whenever he's shot a particularly good scene. I confess I'm having a little difficulty with Josephine DeMille, our St. Bernard. Josephine doesn't always want to sit down when she's asked to. Well, here's a good way to teach Josephine, or any other dog to sit down on command. Put your dog on a leash at your left side. Hold the leash taut in your right hand. With the other hand, stroke the dog's back. Move your hand down his back to a spot where the hindquarters connect with the spine. At this point, there's a reflex nerve. When your hand passes over it, press down a little with your finger and thumb. The dog will automatically sit down. While you're doing this, just tell the dog to sit. As he does it, give him a pat on the head. Try it again a few seconds later. Keep repeating the process until the dog learns to associate the word with the action. The most complicated trick is based on the same simple association. Keep commands short so as not to confuse him. And remember, the secrets of obedience are patience and kindness. A good idea. But Josephine's one drawback is that she usually bites the hand that pats her. <laughs> well, I know. I'll have to send Lightning over to teach her some manners. Of course, everything Lightning does is not exactly a trick. Lightning has a lot of plain common sense. And just to prove that, I brought him along tonight. Lightning... Say hello to Mr. DeMille and all the listeners. You speak to him? That's fine. Now, there's just one more thing, Lightning. A long time ago, when I used to give you a bath with just any kind of ordinary soap, what'd you do whenever I got your tub ready? Well, you don't need to have such a sour face about it. I know. You didn't like it. But now that I wash you in Lux Flakes... Tell the people how much you enjoy a bath. That's fine. (laughs) That's exactly the right answer. No wonder your coat has never shrunk. Okay, Lightning, and thank you all. (laughs) Thank you and Lightning both. Once again, Marion Davies, Brian Ahern, and Benita Hume in Pega My Heart. It's early the following morning, and Peg has already announced her intention of returning to Ireland. Her aunt, knowing nothing of the events of last night, realizes that if Peg leaves, the Chichester family will lose the money they receive for her training. In a desperate attempt to keep Peg in the house, she's persuaded Alaric to make a proposal of marriage to her. Alaric, the family martyr, knocks nervously at Peg's door. Oh, I see Margaret. Come in. Uh, hello. What is it, Alaric? <laughs> Here, Micah, stop that. Yes, I'm afraid that dog still doesn't like me. Oh, he's all right. He's smart, too. Uh, I say, Margaret, you're, you're not really going to leave us, are you? I am that. And if you'd excuse me, I think I'll go on with me packing. I say, why? Why? Have you seen the in papers, Alaric? No. Can I get them for you? Oh, no, Alaric. I know what's in them. I say, Pig, there's something I want to tell you. As you know, I... Uh, uh, I've grown really uh, awfully fond of you. <laughs> you nearly choked you, didn't it? And when did you find that out, uh, that just, you were fond of me? Just now, when, uh, when the thought struck me that perhaps you really meant to leave us. Uh, the idea bruises me. What does it now? It positively bruises. Ah, you'll get over that. No, I don't think I shall. Uh, do you know, I, I'm going to do something I've never done before in my life. Something useful? Uh, what? <laughs> Certainly not. I'm going to ask a very charming young lady to marry me. Oh, what do you think of that now? <laughs> and who do you think it is? I don't know. Guess. I couldn't guess who'd marry you, Alaric. <laughs> it's you. Me? <laughs> oh, Pike. Then, then it's, it's all right. <laughs> it's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard in my life. What? Oh, yes, yes, of course, good. Fine, splendid. <laughs> yes, of course, there's uh, there are one or two little things to be settled first. Only one or two? Oh, just little things. In the first place, I must insist on a little obedience. And uh, no Michael. Oh, I couldn't have Michael? No, no. I'm uh, very firm about that. You're very, very firm about it, yes. Uh, what could you offer me in his place? What could I offer you in the place of... By myself, of course. 
Thanks, I'll keep me dog. <laughs> oh, come, I say, you don't really mean that. You don't actually mean that you're refusing me. Could I make it any plainer? I'm refusing you, Alice. Really? Really. Positively? Positively. Oh, I say thanks very much. Oh, goodbye, old girl. What? <laughs> and thanks again. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, cheerio. Henry. Eric, come here. Oh, Nathan, Nathan, I asked her, and she refused me. Absolutely and positively refused me. I hope you realize how lucky you are. Oh, Mother, please. Oh, I do, I do. But I say, you were the one who put me up to it. Look at this, in the paper. Uh, Mrs. Christopher Brent to sue for divorce. Name's Margaret O'Connor, co-respondent. I say they can't meet Peg. Oh, yes, they can. She was with him last night. Everybody's talking about her, even the servants in the kitchen. It's too bad they can't mind their own business. Ethel, how are you preparing to defend her? You who... What is a Jarvis? This is Gerald, madam. Good morning. You may go, Jarvis. Yes, madam. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. Uh, Good morning, morning. Eric. I saw a cab at the door. Someone coming or leaving? Someone's leaving, and I, for one, shall be very glad to see her go. I assume you're talking about Peg. You know very well we are. Have you seen the morning papers? I have. Well? Oh, I don't believe it, of course. Don't believe it? You suppose they'd print a thing like this if it weren't true? Well, that's what I'm here to find out. When Peg tells me it's true, I'll believe it. Until then, I prefer to think the papers have made a mistake. Now, where is she? In her room, packing. Oh, she mustn't leave England, of course. She'd lose her inheritance. Well, I'm not going to have her here. It was a mistake ever to let her come to this house. Yes, I'm beginning to think so myself. Oh, I see. I suppose you're going to blame us for what happened last night. I don't know that anything did happen. I'm speaking of other things. You were supposed to make a home for her here, and you were well paid for it. Well, have you done it? Have you done anything except make life miserable for her? How could I make a home for a girl like her? Well, you might have tried. If you had, she wouldn't be going away now. Oh. Peg. Good morning, Jerry. I just came in, Aunt, to say goodbye. Well? Oh, wait a moment. Uh, sit down, Peg. It's late. I'm thinking I'm catching the boat for home. Well, you can stay a moment. Sit down, Peg. Um, there's a story in the paper this morning about you and Christopher Brent. I thought there would be. I want you to deny it. Did you hear me, Peg? I heard you. Well, you do deny it, don't you? I I only wish I could. Oh, Peg. You oh. know, Ethel, there's nothing I've got to say, nothing. Peg, listen. I don't believe this story. I can't believe it. I know it can't be true. All I want is for you to tell me so. That's all, Peg. I'm not asking for an explanation. I'm not asking for anything except your own word. Well? I've got nothing to say, Jerry. Oh, Peg. Nothing. I'm sorry, Jerry. Well... Well, my cab is waiting, and, well, I, I guess that's all. Goodbye, Jerry. Well, Jerry, I hope you're satisfied. No. Get her back. Uh, Call her back. Me. She lied to you. What's the matter with she you? She has nothing to do with it. You hear nothing. Peg. Catch her. Catch her there. Ethel. Fainted. Ethel, Ethel. Look at Get me. Get some water. Quick. Passengers this way. Show your tickets, please. Will you let me through, please? No more visitors, miss. But I'm not a visitor. I've got a ticket for the boat I have. May I have a seat, please? Oh, glory be. You've got to let me on. It's starting to storm. Well, if you could show your ticket, miss, I... Oh, shut it out. Shut it out. Shut out the storm. Hey, darling. Hey. Jerry. Oh, it's you, Jerry. Oh, darling, I, I, I want to tell you... Oh, Jerry. Hold me, Jerry. Hold me. It's all right, Peg. It's all right. It's over now. Oh, Jerry. Sure. And I thought it was a punishment for all my sins that time. For lying about Chris Brent. Oh, Jerry. I, I was hoping that you'd know the truth, but you're not angry with oh, me. Oh, I couldn't be angry with you. I love you, Peg. Jerry. What? Did you hear what you said? I think so. Did you mean what you said? I'm sure of it. Oh, Jerry, hold me. I, I think I feel another storm coming on. Close the pages of tonight's play, but bring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern back to you a little later. Where does a young girl live who's come to Hollywood and is trying to make a name in pictures? Some live in little boarding houses, little inexpensive boarding houses. 
But our most famous residence for such girls, a landmark of the film capital for 21 years, is the Hollywood Studio Club. Maintained by the National YWCA, it's under direct supervision of a group of Hollywood women. Scores of our most prominent stars contribute to its upkeep, and it's sponsored by the Motion Picture Producers Association. Mrs. Arthur S. Heinemann, Assistant State Superintendent of Schools, is chairman of the studio club. And Mrs. DeMille, I'm happy to say, is vice chairman of its directing committee, which includes Mrs. James Gleason and Lois Wilson, while Louise Dresser and Mary Pickford are on the advisory committee. But the person to describe what the club is and does is Miss Marjorie Williams, its director for 16 years. Mrs. DeMille tells me, Miss Williams, the club is always filled to capacity, which means that about 100 girls call it home. Of these, who at the moment are making a bid for fame? Well, there's Virginia Walker, for example, a young actress whose portrait occupies an entire page in this month's Esquire. Ida Vollmer and Catherine Aldridge, who appear in The Vogues of 1938, are still with us, and so is Evelyn Keyes, the young Southern girl discovered by Mr. DeMille. Also with us are the secretaries of Eddie Cantor and Myrna Loy, and writers, singers, dancers, script girls, extras, radio actresses, and film cutters. Work in the picture business, you know, is seldom steady. There never was a time when all our girls had jobs. But as a rule, more than half are working at the same time. And who pays the rent when there's no pay envelope coming in? Well, if a girl has exhausted her savings, we do our best to help until she gets a job. Remember, the girls who come to Hollywood are determined to make good. Yet there are hundreds of girls to every job. But still they come. We have them from China, Austria... France and England. Many of them are from colleges, many from excellent homes, some with little or no education, some with only the prize of a beauty contest and the good wishes of their friends. Some arrive by Pullman coach. A few have hitchhiked, and one girl came as a stowaway by way of the Panama Canal. In 21 years, 3,000 girls have lived at the club. How many of them have attained national fame? Only about 20 or 30, Mr. DeMille, which proves how tremendous are the odds against a newcomer. The one career in which there has been distinct success is marriage. About half of the 3,000 marry, and that, after all, is as big and splendid a career as stardom. The wives of Lewis Stone, Marion Cooper, and Jesse Lasky, Jr., all have lived at the club. But getting back to the rent problem... They'll take all kinds of jobs, Mr. DeMille, just to hang on. We have girls singing in nightclubs, one selling insurance. Many have turned typist or business secretary. Some model clothes. And one girl rides an elephant in a circus, still waiting for that chance in pictures. I believe several of the girls have acted in the Lux Radio Theater, haven't they? Yes, they have. This program has many links with the Hollywood Studio Club. Lux is their favorite radio program. And there's no question but that Lux Flakes are their favorite wardrobe care. I don't have to tell you that many girls have moderate incomes or how important it is to dress smartly to work in pictures. Since many girls do at least part of their washing at the club, we know what kind of soap they use. So it should interest you, Mr. DeMille, as it has interested me, to know that Lux Flakes are by far the most popular. In fact, there's really no comparison is so economical and does its job so well. well. We're glad to know that, Miss Williams. Now, can you tell us how a girls' residence club in Hollywood differs from such a club in any other town? It differs to the extent that Hollywood and motion pictures differ from any other place and profession. Every girl here is decidedly an individual. Yet, Hollywood gives them all a oneness of purpose that is a great uniting force. When a girl has had a bad break, when her job hasn't materialized, when her part in the picture gets no further than the floor of the cutting room, she finds a brave sympathy and understanding from her companions. From them, she acquires courage and learns that she can still smile. And to me, that makes Hollywood a far greater place than merely the home of motion pictures. I hope that what I've said tonight will not encourage any girl to come to Hollywood. After 16 years here... There's no better advice I could give than simply this. Unless you are prepared financially and otherwise to come to Hollywood as a year's experiment, hang on to your own job, whatever it is. 
and wait until Hollywood sends for you. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Thank you, Miss Williams. One of the traditions of the Lux Radio Theater is observed at this time, when you meet our stars out of character. A tradition that's never more pleasant than when the stars happen to be Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. <laughs> it seems few things interest our listeners more, Marion, than news of the current activities of a star. What's she doing and what does she plan to do? So what can you reveal to us about yourself? Only this, Mr. DeMille, that I'm looking forward to doing a picture soon. And I've been reading several manuscripts to find the right one. Recently, Walter Wanger kindly offered me his next color picture. And this month, I was very much flattered to receive an invitation from Mr. George Bernard Shaw to come to London and do the picture Pygmalion. I greatly admire George Bernard Shaw, and I'd love to do Pygmalion. But Warner Brothers have the first claim on my services. Moreover, I used to like the idea of making two or three pictures a year, but now I think that you, Mr. De- De- I think that you, Mr. DeMille, have the right idea just to make one good picture a year. And it's been awfully delightful returning to the Lux Radio Theater, and I want to thank everyone here on the stage for the marvelous help in making this such a grand evening. Yeah, thank you, Marion. It's been lovely. Thank, thank you. you. A word now from our air-minded leading man, Brian Ahern. A few days ago, the newspapers had Brian in a plane accident at Palm Springs. Oh, it was my plane all right, Mr. DeMille, but I wasn't in it. And are you going to tell us that you weren't in your plane last month when it made that false lancing in, in Pennsylvania? <laughs> no, Marion. <laughs> I'm afraid I was very much in it. I thought it might be fun to fly to New York from Hollywood all alone in my open plane, <clears throat> but I had no radio and no landing lights. Well, there came a moment when I miscalculated the change of time and found to my horror that the sun had set behind me when I had counted on another hour of light. I ran into a thick ground mist and spent a very few bad ten minutes wondering just what to do. Then through the trees, I managed to spot a dark patch. It turned out to be a pasture, and I set the plane down with a few bumps. Well, quite a few people collected, and when I asked where I was, they told me I wasn't very far from Gradyville. Well, I had never heard of Gradyville, but I knew I was only about 20 miles from Philadelphia, so I inquired the way there. The name seemed to stump them all for a while, until finally one bright-minded individual said he guessed that Philadelphia must be somewhere to the side of Gradyville. And with such specific directions, I found it next, before, next morning and was safely in York Airport an hour later. <laughs> Were you flying to New York to settle details for another stage play this winter? At the time, yes, Mr. DeMille, but I'm working on the Hal Roach picture Merrily We Live at the moment, and it seems to look as though I might not make it. But I'm learning the art of blind flying, and that's almost exciting enough to compensate for no play this year. Till next time, then, thanks and good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, Miss Davies. Good night, Mr. Ahern. Thank you, Miss Davies and Mr. Ahern. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruiz. There's another outstanding show awaiting you next Monday night, and Mr. DeMille tells you about it in just a moment. Assisting our stars tonight were Edward Broadley as David, Eric Snowden as Christopher Brent, Doris Lloyd as Mrs. Brent, Michael Fitzmorris as Port Officer, Wallace Roberts as Flint, Lou Merrill as Bradley, Frank Nelson as a guard, and Ingborg Tillish and Doris Luray as Irish women. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Second Honeymoon, and Mr. McDonald through courtesy of Columbia Studios. Now, just before Mr. DeMille returns, we want to remind you that this is the time to help the 1937 drive to fight tuberculosis. Help make the world safer. Purchase your supply of anti-tuberculosis Christmas seals now. Use them on all your Christmas mail. Show that you're helping fight the dread disease, too. Buy seals for Christmas, and you buy help for the new year. And now, Mr. DeMille. Around our microphone next Monday night will be grouped several of Hollywood's most popular performers, playing a drama that triumphed on Broadway and became one of Samuel Goldwyn's most successful motion pictures. It was applauded the world over under the title of These Three, a powerful and original drama with a splendid romantic feeling. It stars Barbara Stanwyck, Errol Flynn, Mary Astor, Constance Collier, Alma Kruger, and Marsha May Jones. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck, Errol Flynn, and Mary Astor and an all-star cast in These Three. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood.
broadcasting system. This is Chestertonradio.com.